Imagine a time when knights, castles, and feudal lords were not just tales of folklore, but the very fabric of daily life. You see, the Middle Ages were a time of great contrast and complexity. While kings and queens feasted in grand halls, the common folk struggled in the shadow of plague, famine, and relentless warfare. But there's more to this era than just the dark and the grim. The seeds of the Renaissance were being sown, innovations were emerging, and the stage was set for a great transformation. So how did people really live during these turbulent times? What secrets lay hidden behind the castle walls? And what lessons can this far-off era still teach us today? Buckle up, because we're journeying back to a world that's both fascinating and foreboding. This is the story of life in the Middle Ages. It was a long time ago when people lived close to nature and worked on farms. A time when life was intertwined with the rhythm of the agrarian calendar. Can you imagine waking up early when the sun is just rising? The houses in the village were cozy, and everything happened in the center of the village. Let's journey through the fascinating and challenging existence of peasant farmers. Imagine a calming village nestled amidst lush green fields and pastures, with houses, barns, sheds, and animal pens huddled together. The heart of the village was where the magic of daily life unfolded. Let's meet the hardworking and resilient peasant families. They toiled tirelessly to grow enough food to sustain themselves throughout the year. These days were marked by church feasts that signaled the sowing and reaping days. These were moments of respite for both peasant and lord, a time to rejoice and recharge after hours spent cultivating the land. The peasants living in the manor by the castle had their strips of land. This is where the peasants grew crops like rye, oats, peas, and barley, and they used special tools like the scythe, sickle, and reaper to help them. People in the village helped each other out a lot. Each family had their own piece of land, but they also worked together to do big tasks like plowing and haying. Besides farming, they did other projects assigned by the lords, like building roads and cutting down trees. Their lives were a balance between doing their own work and helping the lords. The food they ate was simple but good. They had porridge made from wheat, oats, and barley, along with soups, vegetables, and bread. They didn't eat meat often, mainly in the winter when they had to use their animals for food. They drank wine and ale because water wasn't safe to drink. Life as a medieval peasant was not easy. They faced challenges like bad weather that could ruin their crops and lead to hunger. In tough times, they had to adapt and support each other to survive. But it wasn't all hard work and challenges. Despite the hardships, medieval villages were not without their charms. There were fun times, too. The villagers had festivals and parties where everyone came together to dance, sing, and play games. These joyful moments were a break from their daily chores. One must not forget the social hierarchy that governed their lives. Above the peasants were the nobles and lords, who held the reins of power, and the peasants worked for them. The peasants gave their labor and resources to the lords, and in return, the lords protected them. This system shaped how people of different classes interacted with each other. Even though they lived in a farming world, the villagers still had some learning. The village church was a place of education. The local priest taught them about religion and other basic things. But only a few lucky ones got to go to proper schools. In the later stages of the Middle Ages, trade and commerce began to flourish, and towns grew. This provided some peasants with opportunities to escape the confines of rural life and seek better fortunes in urban centers. Still, for the vast majority, the village remained the center of their universe. The life of a medieval peasant was challenging. Still, it was also filled with resilience and community spirit. Their legacy reminds us that strength and togetherness can overcome significant obstacles. Isn't that interesting? Now get ready for another exciting story. Let's step inside their humble homes. But before that, have you ever wondered what exactly these houses were made of? Well, prepare to be amazed. Their houses were called crook houses, and they were made in a special way. The houses had a wooden frame and were covered with a mixture of mud, straw, and yes, even manure. But the manure had a purpose. It helped hold everything together. The straw served as insulation, keeping the peasants warm during chilly winters. But living in a crook house came with its challenges. These were not exactly spacious, and their thatched roofs sheltered only a modest interior. Inside these houses, there wasn't much space, and they had simple furniture. And can you imagine what the temperature was like inside these houses? 
Well, let's say that medieval air conditioning wasn't a thing. During summers, the Kruk houses turned into saunas, while in bone-chilling winters, they became frosty iceboxes. Now, let's talk about the windows and doors. Glass was a precious commodity in medieval times, so Kruk houses did not have glass panes. Instead, holes in the walls served as makeshift windows. As for doors, they were also expensive, which led to a creative solution. And guess what they used as doors? Curtains. Curtains covering the entranceways. Talk about a unique way to welcome guests. But here's something interesting. Kruk houses were not only for people. They were also cozy abodes for the peasants' furry and feathered friends. Yes, you heard that right. At the end of each day, the medieval peasants would bring their animals inside the house for a sleepover. Wolves and bears still roamed the English countryside back then. So bringing the animals indoors protected them from these wild predators. It also kept them safe from potential thieves and wandering off in the dark of night. Now, let's discuss some modern-day necessities absent in medieval peasant life. Take, for example, toilets, running water, baths, and sinks. Yes, you heard it right. These were all luxuries that peasants did not have the pleasure of experiencing. The lack of running water meant that daily chores were no easy feat. And soap? That was a distant dream for them. Medieval peasants had to contend with fleas, lice, and general filth. So how did they manage their bathroom needs without modern plumbing? Well, forget about the convenience of a flush toilet. Medieval peasants relied on something far less sophisticated, a trusty bucket. Each morning, they throw the bucket's contents into the nearest river. This serves as a communal bathroom break for the village. Living in a Kruk house was a challenging experience. Still, it showed how clever and strong the medieval peasants were. Their ingenuity in building these simple yet functional homes was incredible. The way they share their living space with animals for safety is also commendable. Not to mention their ability to adapt to a life without modern amenities. All provide a fascinating glimpse into a world that feels so distant from our own. Let's begin with the young ones, the children of medieval peasants. Can you believe that the odds were stacked against them from the very beginning? Can you believe that about half of all babies born back then didn't even reach their first birthday? That's really sad. Unlike today, education, a privilege cherished in our modern world, was a rarity for the lower class. Schools were mostly for rich or religious people. Instead, the children of peasants learned the essentials of life on the family farm. As they worked alongside their parents, they absorbed the skills of agriculture, as well as nurturing crops and tending to livestock. Some young boys would even become apprentices, learning the trades of blacksmithing, tailoring, or other crafts. This way, they could become skilled workers when they grew up. But these educational opportunities were not available to all. For girls, the learning path took on a different form. Their education was primarily domestic, passed down from mothers to daughters. With spinning wheels, they learned the art of transforming wool into warm blankets and clothes. As the cycle of life continued, the girls grew into women, destined for unique challenges of their own. But things were a bit different for girls. For women in medieval times, having children was fraught with danger. One out of every five women died while giving birth. It made having a baby a scary thing. Once a mother, a woman's role in peasant society was often confined to the home. It is where she would care for her family and tend to household responsibilities. Yet in larger villages, some women were granted more opportunities beyond the household. They can go into local shops, pursuing occupations contributing to their family. Others found employment in wealthier households, serving as dedicated and hardworking servants. Even with all these tough rules and limits, the women of medieval peasant society were incredibly strong and determined. They became the backbone of their families, managing their households. Of course, with dedication and unwavering love. Isn't that heartwarming? Now, let's check out the next one. Long ago, Picture a time when there were no big factories or fancy machines. Instead, you could hear the sounds of blacksmiths hammering on metal, creating tools and weapons. There were also merchants in busy markets, talking loudly and trying to agree on prices for their goods. This lively world was made possible by a group of people called the middle class. This group bridged the gap between the opulent nobility and the hardworking peasants. But how did this intriguing class come into existence? And what was their role in shaping the course of history? In the early Middle Ages, society was divided into three main groups, 
First, there were the clergy, who were religious leaders. Then, there was the nobility, who were rich and powerful. Finally, there were the common people, who were the majority and mostly worked as farmers. But as time went on, something interesting happened. Trade and business started to grow, and a new class emerged, the middle class. Unlike the traditional groups, they were a mix of individuals with various skills and jobs. Some were merchants who traded goods. Others were skilled workers like artisans who made beautiful things. And there were also doctors and university graduates in this group. What united the middle class was their desire to learn, earn money, and move up in society. They didn't want to be stuck in the same position forever. Their hard work and contributions to society made them very important. They helped bring about changes and advancements in many areas, making life better for everyone. So the middle class was like a bridge that connected the wealthy nobles and the hardworking farmers. They played a crucial role in shaping history, bringing progress, and making the world more vibrant and exciting. Imagine you're walking through the twisting streets of a medieval city. The city is bustling with activity, and many merchants are selling their goods. These merchants were like the backbone of the middle class, which means they were an essential part of society. These merchants had a very cool job. In the market, merchants were like entertainers. They would shout and show off their goods in bright colors to attract customers. They were also very clever negotiators. They knew how to talk and make deals with people so they could get the best prices for their goods. But the life of a medieval merchant was not without its perils. They traveled faraway places to get special and exciting things like spices, silks, and precious metals. Merchants faced the constant threat of bandits and pirates. Caravans were often attacked, and ships were susceptible to storms and attacks at sea. Despite these risks, the rewards of successful trade ventures were immense. Merchants were often willing to take calculated gambles for the promise of prosperity. One of the coolest things about being a merchant was meeting people from different places with their own customs and traditions. They got to learn about new cultures and share their knowledge with others. This made the world a more exciting and connected place. As merchants became richer, they also became more critical in their cities. They used their money to help build things like roads and bridges, and they even got to be friends with important people like kings and queens. In the grand tapestry of medieval society, middle-class merchants were the weavers of prosperity and connections. Their endeavors contributed to the economic growth of cities, the exchange of knowledge, and the enrichment of cultures. They played a pivotal role in transforming the Middle Ages by laying the flourishing trade networks that would later shape the world we know today. Alongside the merchants, we encounter doctors, beacons of hope in an era when medical knowledge was very limited. These skilled healers employed a combination of herbal remedies and faith and practical experience to alleviate suffering. Their expertise not only improved the health of individuals, but they also contributed to the overall vitality of the middle class. But becoming a doctor was arduous and required years of dedicated study. The medical profession journey began at universities or medical schools. These institutions, though primitive by today's standards, offered a rigorous curriculum. It covers subjects like anatomy, herbal remedies, and the prevailing medical theories of the time. Graduating from these institutions marked the first step toward becoming a respected doctor. Once qualified, doctors often set up their practices in urban centers. This is where they cater to a diverse population. Their medical knowledge extended beyond treating physical ailments. They also addressed mental and spiritual health, often incorporating elements of faith and superstition into their treatments. Doctors faced challenges due to their limited understanding of medical science. Traditional treatment methods were often based on ancient texts and outdated beliefs. Bloodletting, for example. It was a notorious treatment that might seem unusual to us today. The financial aspect of a doctor's life in the middle class was also noteworthy. While they were better off than many commoners, their income was not comparable to that of nobility or wealthy merchants. Doctors often had to strike a delicate balance between providing affordable services to the majority of the population while still sustaining themselves and their families. Socially, middle-class doctors interacted with individuals from various walks of life. They could attend to peasants, merchants, and even nobles. 
transcending social boundaries and pursuing their noble profession. Their status granted them access to the circles of power and influence. This allows them to become advisors to nobility or esteemed community members. Amidst the prevailing darkness of the Middle Ages, they sought to enlighten themselves. Universities became centers of intellectual exploration. Scholars from various backgrounds engage in debates on theology, philosophy, and the sciences. But going to university was not easy for regular families. It cost a lot of money, and students had to live far away from home. Still, they thought it was worth it because education could help them get good jobs and be respected. Some famous universities, like Bologna, Paris, and Oxford, attracted intelligent people. These graduates became very knowledgeable and started questioning how things were done. They laid the foundation for a big cultural and intellectual rebirth called the Renaissance, but the middle-class people who were becoming successful faced some difficulties. The rich and powerful people in charge feared them and tried to control them. They put taxes and restrictions on the middle class to stop them from rising. Even so, the middle class didn't give up. They used their money to support art and culture. They helped artists and architects create beautiful cathedrals and breathtaking literature. Their influence on European history was significant and unforgettable. In the Middle Ages, power and influence rested in the hands of the elite, the royalty, nobility, and church officials. Uh, but let us not be deceived by their grandeur, for their lives were far from straightforward. In a complex dance of authority and rivalry, these three groups navigated a delicate balance of power that shaped the destiny of kingdoms and the course of history. Let's imagine the royal court, where the kings and queens ruled over everyone. But the nobles also wanted more power and land, so they tried to be independent and grow their territories. On top of that, the church, led by the pope, had a lot of spiritual power and even tried to control the kings and nobles. But the question is, who indeed held the reins of power? Was it the royalty, the nobility, or the top church officials? The answer lay in the intricate web of alliances, rivalries, and negotiations that defined the upper echelons of society during the Middle Ages. The daily lives of these elite groups were a stark contrast to the toils of the lower classes. Castles with their imposing presence may have been drafty, but they were also a testament to opulence and privilege. Royalty and nobility were attended by an array of staff, enjoying grand feasts that tantalized their taste buds each night. Yet let's not forget the constant specter of war that loomed over the nobility. They were expected to lead armies into battle. Victory could mean glory and riches, but defeat could lead to a dark fate. But even in the face of capture, nobles had an advantage, the possibility of ransom sparing them from the grisly fate met by ordinary soldiers. Take, for instance, Richard the Lionhearted, a king who embodied the paradoxes of his class. He reigned over England for a decade, but spent much of that time fighting alongside the soldiers he commanded. Such was the complex reality of the upper class, where duty and privilege intertwined. And then there were the revered church officials, whose authority transcended temporal realms. Their status demanded respect and often garnered extravagant gifts, a testament to the spiritual significance they held in the hearts of the faithful. The royalty, nobility, and top church officials were, after all, human, ambitious, fallible, and bound by the constraints of their time. They remind us that pursuing power and influence is often a double-edged sword. They can shape destinies, but also bear the weight of profound responsibility. How did nobles balance their responsibilities to both their lands and fellow nobles? What were the intricacies of their relationships? And how did they navigate the delicate dance of power and loyalty within their ranks? Within the hallowed walls of a monarch's court, a world of etiquette flourished. Courtiers, comprising the ruler's camarilla, retinue, household, and nobility, reveled in serving the central figure. The court was a bustling stage welcoming emissaries from distant lands and offering refuge to foreign nobility in exile. But it was not all glamour and splendor. Courts adhered to a strict order of precedence, with royal and noble ranks defining each individual's place. Ceremonies abounded, marking significant events like the coronation of the monarch. The waking and sleeping of the monarch were also steeped in ceremonial significance. As we look into the lives of court officials, we find a fascinating interplay of tradition and change. 
many of their positions rooted in practical household duties evolved into archaic titles. Roles such as butler, falconer, and page hearkened back to a time when noble households had a diverse array of responsibilities. In these elegant households, life was not just about matters of state and politics. Nobility found pleasure in games, especially chess. Music, too, played an integral role in their daily lives. The mesmerizing tunes of troubadours and trouvers accompanied by skilled instrumentalists. This added a touch of artistry and romance to the noble existence. Yet beyond the opulence, nobility also grappled with the weight of responsibility. As lords and protectors of their lands, they were bound by duty to ensure the well-being of their subjects. Their decisions shaped the fates of countless lives, making their positions both a privilege and a burden. Education and learning were the hallmarks of privilege and prestige, most significantly for those in the upper class. Imagine the splendid halls of noble residences, where tutors and scholars imparted wisdom. Education for the upper class was a prized privilege. It showed how important they were and made them different from regular people. The question is, what subjects were at the core of their education? How did they balance the pursuit of knowledge with the responsibility of their roles? And how did education contribute to their influence and authority within society? Now, let's find out what they actually learned. They had a well-rounded education with private tutors teaching them. They learned many subjects, including a language called Latin, which was like a secret language for educated people. History, philosophy, rhetoric, and theology were integral components. These shaped their worldview and understanding of the world. Moreover, the courts of monarchs and high-ranking nobles often served as centers of intellectual activity. Scholars, poets, and philosophers found patronage in the upper class. Their ideas and creations flourished under the benevolence of noble households. But their education wasn't only about books and classes. It was also about becoming good and honorable individuals. They believed in a noble code called chivalry. It emphasized virtues such as honor, courage, and compassion. These principles were instilled in the minds of young nobles and guides their actions and decisions as they took on their leadership roles, as well as protectors of their lands. One institution that played a role in the education of the upper class was the university. These prestigious learning centers attracted noble students from across kingdoms. It offers advanced studies in law, medicine, theology, and the liberal arts. Universities became breeding grounds for critical thinking, and intellectual discourse, shaping the minds of future rulers and statesmen. However, not all wealthy families made education a priority. Some focused more on training in fighting and other noble activities. So, not everyone in the upper class had access to education. The education of the upper class showed how knowledge is really powerful. It shaped the destinies of individuals and nations, leaving a profound impact that reverberates through the annals of time. If you enjoyed this video, check out the next one for more interesting historical facts.